Welcome back, everyone. Um, you know, I think it's clear that we need something <laughs> besides the industrialized food system. And so my presentation is um, a few thoughts towards this alternative. Um, it's titled Agroecology for Food Sovereignty and Climate Justice. Um, my presentation is a shorter one, um, and there are three main sections. Firstly, just to look at some definitions. Secondly, the elephant in the room. I'm feeling as, as if the elephant has been maligned <laughs> in this room. Um, and then thirdly, what is to be done. But quite a bit of that will we'll carry on at the end where Vanessa will facilitate a short session for us. So I'm just starting with definitions for agroecology, food sovereignty, and I'm going to try for climate justice. Um, it's really important for us to have a good understanding about these terms, um, especially something like agroecology. It's very clear to many of us what it exactly means, but one can see how this term has been co-opted by industry, and it's starting to mean things that it really doesn't mean or shouldn't mean. So I'll look at definitions and then, um, yeah, firstly. So agroecology is a, a holistic science, a practice, and a global movement for food sovereignty and climate justice. So there's something about agroecology which is not just practices, it's not just how to make manure, how to save seed. There's much more to it than that. It's, we do say it's a holistic science because it's built on knowledge and it's on people's knowledge. And it's knowledge which has been passed down from generation to generation. It's also new knowledge which is incorporated. There is the global movement or a movement side of things. So there's a real social justice element to agroecology, what is fair and right. So some of what you see is not huge farms, and I say farms in inverted commas, which are owned by people who own thousands of hectares of land, employ hundreds and hundreds of workers, often in very difficult or awful conditions. If you look at agroecology and the way it works, you will see that it's actually people who are farming, people who are using the land, and there, is an, um, there isn't the inequality about it that we see in, in um, agribiz. Um, I'm going to show you slides now on agroecology because the more I thought about agroecology, the more difficult it is to give people a real overview and I thought these pictures, I hope, will, will give, speak something more to agroecology. So there's also the focus on biodiversity, on people's knowledge, on crops which are resilient to drought. Um, there is something about the experience of others, and I can show some of the farmers that Biowatch works with, and we're actually very happy today to have two of those farmers with us, Petrus Makanya and Tombatini and Bandwe. So I'll be showing pictures from there, where, where we can learn more about agroecology. Uh, this first photograph is um, uh, from uh, Kwahoho near Mutubatuba, north of Durban. And this is a market garden, you can see the close-up of it which um, Tombatini and Duanwe is a key driver and force um, in this work, which is uh, supplying food. It is for the markets, but it is for local markets. And on the left, you can see uh, an aerial view of, of that. Um, and if you look at that, you can see there's much of the natural environment which is left. And globally, if we look at who is conserving biodiversity, it is smallholder farmers, peasants, indigenous people. That's, that's where biodiversity is being conserved. Um, 
There's something about power, where the power sits, and when I sit, look at this photograph of three farmers from Nguvuma, I think these are powerful people. They know what they're about, and they know how to farm. And here is Petrus um, Macania with his wife, and then some of the plants from his, his homestead. So you can see the diversity there. Um, for the sort of ecological, the environmental side, also for food and nutrition. And I think that's one of the things that agroecology brings is healthy food. So it's not over-processed, um, looking good, but having very few nutrients. It really brings a strong element of nutrition. And here's Tompatini, who you can speak to at lunchtime. So these are real resource people for us to draw upon their knowledge and to learn about agroecology. Uh, this is a uh, photograph of Inner Lenny Farm, which is just between Durban and Peter Marinsburg, and Richard Haig, who was here earlier but can't, couldn't stay. But he runs a small agroecological farm and does a lot of training. You can really experience what agroecology is about and what excellent, what we say, delicious and nutritious food is about. So it's a real resource for, for us in KwaZulu-Natal. Oh, and I should point out that at the bottom left, that's Richard with his donkey and Lawrence and Kalipi from Biowatch on the left. So oh, Lawrence also being Biowatch Agroecology Manager, good person to speak to. Um, Biowatch has been hosting what we call Come and See. See, this is with farmers that we work with. If you wanted to get a sort of practical understanding of agroecology, these are held every couple of months, just a one day visit up to Matuba Tuba to come and have a look, come and see. And then this last slide is on some of the Biowatch publications which focus on agroecology. Um, but also the, the latest one, which is on the industrialized food system. But at the end of it, you'll see a bit on why, why we think agroecology. Um, so the second of the words was food sovereignty. Um, and many of you will know this word. You also know the phrase food security. And there's a very important distinction between the two. So food security is really it's having enough food, it's access to food, um, and they say nutritious food as well. But as Andrew mentioned, one can have food security. So in South Africa, for example, at a national level, we have food security. But we know the levels of hunger, malnutrition, and stunting in the country. Food sovereignty is much more. You have the power in people's hands, you have culturally appropriate food. You have good ways of production of the food. Um, and also the, the right to define one's own sort of food and agricultural systems. So it's much more to do with the right to food. Right, this climate justice definition. I regretted deeply this topic, which initially I hadn't... Um, Others had thought of the topic, and I said, no, sure, I'll do that. And then when I came to this and was looking for a definition for climate justice, I had to ask for a lot of help. And then still, the, the more I looked at the definition, the more difficult I found to... Uh, like one knows in principle what it is, but when you look at the actual definitions, each word means something, and um, eventually, well, Des helped, and then Andrew, and... So what you see here are three bullets which came out for me. I'll just read through them. But firstly, that there's an acknowledgement that justice and inequality are at the root causes of climate change and its impacts. Then climate justice links development and human rights to achieve a human-centered approach to addressing climate change, safeguarding the rights of the most vulnerable people, and ensuring that it is not the vulnerable and those least responsible for climate change who carry its burdens. 
And I think all those graphs that Vanessa showed us is you can see that that's what's happened. The most vulnerable in society will bear the burdens of climate change. And then the last one, it's also about ensuring that the benefits of a just transition are shared equally. And th this, I think, is quite tricky because we are moving towards a transition away from petrol, away from oil, away from all sorts of things, but it's also gaps in opportunity for big business. And I think one's got to, we've got to use our voices and really critique what, what is happening. So I'm afraid it's not a neat definition of climate justice, but I hope it's helpful. Yeah, is our elephant in the room. But actually, I'm very, <laughs> very fond of elephants, although it's slightly terrified of them. But in English, this word, the elephant in the room, is something about, you know, when there's something which we should be seeing, we should be addressing, but we're not. And for this presentation for today, we say it's actually the industrialised food system that is the elephant in the room. So it's something that we need to make visible. We can see the impact. We can see the global greenhouse gas emissions that are coming from this food system. And for us in Firewatch, agroecology offers something different. There's something about the industrialised food system. It's, very, it's quite difficult to see because in many ways, for many of us, it's the way we've been brought up. Those of you who haven't been brought up in that system are, are very lucky. For it's lots of people who will look at this, and I've chosen two pictures here because they seem to see a lot of in KwaZulu Natal. The one on the left is tree plantation, so not really agriculture, and the other one is a sugar plantation, which is really not really food either. But there's something about these photos, if you look at them through one lens, you could say, oh, they look so productive. You know, it's, the land's been used, it's not uh, abandoned. Um, but if you look at it in another way, you're going to see uh, monocultures, you see one species, you're going to go there, it's going to be very quiet. There's not life, there's not a lot of life there at all. Um, and the scale of these. So, if you look, if you fly in, uh, or you fly over KwaZulu Natal, the extent of these plantations, of monocultures, is just huge. One can't believe it. So there's something about how we see things, and how we see monocultures, also how we see diversity. So you, you go to an agroecology farm, the, you sit down, the more you look, the more you're going to see. So you will see a huge range of diversity. And that's not what you see here. Even things like mealies, which one thinks is food and uh, it's good to grow, look at the extent of it. And is it mixed with other plants? Is it part of the three sisters? No, with the, the pumpkins and the, and the beans. <laughs> How can I forget? <laughs> yeah. But, or is it planted as a single crop? Um, and how vast is it? Is it enough for a, a community or is it for export? Yeah, look at the scale of it. Right, the last part of the presentation is really what is to be done. And I think it's a question for each one of us at a personal level. What, what is it that we can do? Each of us can do something. And that's, I think that's really important to, to start with ourselves. Then one can work at a local level, at a national level, at an international level. So some people will be able to work at the local level, work with your communities. Others will be able to look at national policy. And what Andrew was saying, it's not, sometimes there's good policy, it's just not implemented. But holding holding people to, holding government to account. The international level, there's a lot of international, not a lot, but there are international mechanisms which su support us. There's the United Nations Declaration on Peasants, uh, UN drop. There's the Plant Treaty, which has a clause on farmers' rights. There, 
there are international mechanisms which can support us equally as we as we heard from Andrew, there are other things which are working against this. Um, yeah, so agroecology, um, yeah, have a look at the publications at the back, but you can speak, see it's speaking to a lot of, about conserving water, good soils, food sovereignty, um, conserving biodiversity and supporting communities. Um, if we look at climate um, justice, I think agroecology speaks to these three main tasks. I'm just going to read them out. Um, so there are three key tasks for building climate resilience in the food system for a just transition. Firstly, reduce emissions across the food system, and this is known as mitigation. So. It's something about, it's not doing those carbon credits. It's not seeing um, what you can, what Andrew was describing where um, companies in the north can buy, in a sense, carbon credits by continuing to pollute, but to use generally land in the south for, as carbon credits. And there's a, there's a whole lot um, behind that one that one can speak to. Uh, so it's really important to just see what people are doing to decrease emissions. So you might look like a big um, agricultural machinery and think about the emissions that are related to that, or the packaging, or the waste. The second thing is make food production and distribution more climate res resilient, and that's adaptation. And agroecology speaks to that as well. And lastly, meeting social and nutritional needs. Um, yeah, at the moment, the nutritional, it's sort of, it's, I mean, I think of this biofortification, and you think of all the vitamins which are added. You have highly processed food, then you just add some more vitamins, or have more vitamin pills. It doesn't matter if you haven't eaten properly. But there's something here about nutrition and why in the international sphere, they don't just say food security now, they use, you've got to say food security and nutrition, because you might have food to fill your stomach, but it's actually not going to feed you with the nutrients you need as a person. Okay. So to end off, um, it's, I'll just read it out again. Building climate resilience in the food system for a just transition means a transformative resilience that addresses the roots of vulnerability and tackles the systems and power relations that need changing. It's going back to the roots of the problem. And then the next slide is more, it's a quote which I found more accessible about this from a person called Pablo Salon. And it is from some years back, but it really just was very clear to me, so I would like to read it out as well. Um, the, the battle to change climate change will be mainly in the daily life of people, in the streets, in the forests, in the fields. And it's a battle very much related to concrete struggles to stop extractivist projects, to stop red projects, to stop the land grabbing. And also to develop proposals of a systemic alternative. The climate movement has a very good slogan, system change, not climate change. And he goes on to focus about um, talking about system change and the importance of movements across sectors. So not just us here today, but linking with other sectors, with other movements, and how that is, is needed to make the systemic change. Um, we're saying that this climate crisis also does give us an opportunity to promote agroecology as a way forward. It's something very positive and strong that we can bring to this debate. So I'd like to thank you all for listening and um, yeah, I'm very happy to take some questions. Thank you.